Yeah. <laughs> just, just one question first. Chelsea, there doesn't appear to be a chat box. Is there a chat oh. box and I'm just missing it? There is oh, one. I found it. I Never see one, yeah. I found it. Okay. Yeah. We might mention that, Rita, that people can put questions in chat. Good, good. Okay, it is now 12.02, so we don't want to take away any more time from our speaker. So I'm Rita Efros, and I'm part of this Tuesday Teaching Tuesday Committee, along with Rosie Marshall, Rabbi Joseph, Sally Rosenfeld, and Anita Mention. And today we're delighted to welcome a speaker who's been a longtime member of CBI and has been in Portland since 1980, having arrived here uh, after several years moving from Harvard, where she got her PhD in anatomy, moving with her husband, who's a physician. They were both recruited to OHSU. Eileen was um, an associate professor of anatomy and Joe was a physician. About a year later, something happened in Eileen's brain and she decided to transition to her true love, which was art. And so she went back to school as if she hadn't had enough education. And she got a master's of fine arts at the Pacific Northwest College of Art. And since then, she's been creating artwork since then. And um, her work's been shown extensively in Oregon, Washington, California, and many other states, as well as on the international scene. Her drawings and paintings and wire sculptures live in many private and public collections, including, I know Rabbi Joseph has one, but also <laughs> the Corvallis City Hall, Portland City College, and um, Mitch Snyder Homeless sh Shelter in Washington, DC. She has taught art at several um, places, including um, the Pacific Northwest College of Art and at several smaller art centers in the metropolitan area. She continues to work at her Southeast Portland studio, which is about two miles from her home in South Waterfront, where I was lucky enough to meet her. And you can see more of her artwork on her website, www.eskart.net. And in between all that, in 1994, she actually had the time to publish a book called Forms of Protest, Drawings and Poems About Racism. So she's a neuroscientist, an artist, and a poet, a woman of many talents. So please join me in welcoming Eileen Kane. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, thank you, Rita. That's a, a very full and nice introduction. And it, it leaves me some extra time, so I don't have to say any of those things. Yeah. Um, I think we can start. I'm, I'm going to use a PowerPoint for this um, so that I can um, illustrate what I'm saying. I hope you all can see the screen, um, which is just basically an introduction to who I am. Um, basically, what I wanted to tell you today um, involves my um, my early love for two different fields. Um, I always loved art. I was always drawing and painting. Um, and I also always loved biology and science. Um, and in college, um, I really was geared very much towards science and became um, a major in zoology. Um, I'm old enough that they had zoology <laughs> and botany separated. Um, and when I graduated in 1967, um, I went straight to graduate school and decided um, that I would go for a PhD, um, even though I stopped in the middle to get my master's since one never knows if you're gonna get a PhD or not while you're in the program. Um, in the next slide, okay, what I'm going to do is explain to you about some of the things I did as a graduate student, which were formed the basis for my research in neuroanatomy, the study of the structure of the nervous system. So first of all, um, I'll probably refer to CNS, which is the central nervous system. It, it includes the brain and the spinal cord, and I apologize to those of you who know all this. Um, a neuron is a nerve cell itself, 
and dendrites are the branches of a neuron that receive input from other cells. The axon is the branch of a neuron that sends output to other neurons. My particular field of study was the auditory system or the hearing system. And basically that involves the auditory nerve, which comes from the inner ear and all of the CNS structures that process hearing. Parenchyma is a word I just love. Um, <laughs> and it just means tissue that fills spaces in organs and in the brain. And we'll see that in a minute. Um, my particular area of study was the cochlear nucleus, which is a large group of, um, rather a group of large nerve cells in the brain, and they receive the very first input from the auditory nerve. Uh, my focus was on cells which um, were dubbed octopus cells because they're very large and um, they're located in a very discrete part of the cochlear nucleus. If we go to the next slide, um, this is an octopus cell. Um, and this, all of the photomicrographs that you're going to be seeing here are uh, photographs that I took through a microscope. And I think as you're looking at them, you'll see that the visual part of my work in science um, was extremely important. So what you're seeing here is a large cell um, with three prominent branches. And maybe you can see one smaller branch, but the larger branches are dendrites and the little tiny one is an axon. So this is the cell that was my focus. Uh, next slide. Okay, and this is also uh, the Golgi stain approach um, to the auditory nerve. The Golgi method was um, actually created in the 19th century. It's a very old neuroanatomical method, and it um, fills cells <clears throat> with a silver dichromate. Um, solution, but only some. So you're able to, to look at, if you look at the bottom left of that slide, you'll see that there are several fibers coming in and you might see that they're branching. Um, they divide into ascending and descending branches. And I was following the descending branches to the area of octopus cells. Next slide. And here are the octopus cells again in a different kind of stain. Um, this one really only shows the cell bodies and a little bit of the dendrites. Um, and the stuff that looks empty is the parenchyma of the brain, um, which is, um, as you'll see in the next slide, it's actually not empty at all but it's filled with all kinds of fibers and little cells and blood vessels in this area that I was studying. Um, if you look at the big cell bodies and just around the edges, you can see little uh, dark red dots around them. And those are actually endings from the auditory nerve and from other places, um, which are seen better in electron micrographs. Next slide. This um, image is another octopus cell at a larger magnification um, where you can see the cell and some of its branches as well as um, those endings around the body of the cell and up onto the branches. Um, this is actually a plastic section um, and it's called a thick section, even though it's much thinner than the others I showed you, because this is the preparation that you do before you go to the electron microscope um, to study things in much higher resolution. Next slide. Okay, here's an octopus cell, um, which if you can see the little arrows on the cell, it's pointing to, it's the smaller arrows, point to these little projections that live, um, they're sort of coming out of the cell body. And the inset in the upper left shows you one of those projections with um, a thickening, and that actually is a synapse, um, the place where one cell impinges on another and actually is the site of electronic transmission. Next slide, please. 
and here um, is a drawing I did in uh, in as part of my studies um, of one of these uh, Golgi impregnated octopus cells. You can see almost the entire cell by focusing up and down on the microscope and looking at different levels of the cell and the and the processes. So this was done as an ink drawing. Um, and then let's go to the following slide. Okay, and these are electron micrographs. Um, and what you're seeing on the left particularly is a very large ending. And this ending I've identified as from the auditory nerve because of its size and shape. So what I did was I looked at um, nerve endings from the auditory nerve in the Golgi preparations. I measured them and looked at their shape, and then I compared them to what I saw in the electron microscope. And as a result of these combined studies, let's go to the next slide. Okay, what I found, and this is a diagram of what I found, is that um, if you look on the right-hand side of this diagram, you'll see fibers coming in, and in black, you'll see these large black ovoid structures, which are um, one kind of ending from these fibers um, that are very large, ovoid, and they land on the cell body and on the dendrites. You also see that there are some very small endings coming from the same fibers, and they also end on octopus cells. So this in itself was an unusual uh, set of structures where one axon, namely the auditory nerve, was coming into the cochlear nucleus, and it was providing two completely different endings onto these same cells. So I called the cells homotypic cells and the endings heterotypic cells. It turned out that um, I was lucky enough to be coordinating my work with another graduate student at Harvard who was studying the physiology of octopus cells. And what he found um, in his physiological studies was that there were actually two kinds of responses in these cells when you stimulated the auditory nerve. And his studies are shown at the bottom and I'm not gonna go into the electrophysiology here. Okay, um, I think at this point I make a transition. Let's try the next slide. Yeah, okay. So as Rita told you, we're not there yet. We will stay here in the transition. Um, after um, working at several different institutions, um, including University of Massachusetts Medical School, um, Tufts University, and the University of Chicago, um, both Joe and I moved back to um, Massachusetts in 1977, where I was um, promoted to an associate uh, associate professor level, and I expected to stay there. Um, however, you know, all our good plans are subject to change, and things change such that um, by 1979, um, just as we were in the process of working on the uh, adoption of our first child, um, it became clear that I was not going to be able to stay at UMass Medical School for eternity. Um, we had a new department chair who came in and shook things up. So um, I started looking for other positions and it turned out um, I had a good friend who had a lab here in Oregon at um, what was then called University of Oregon Health Sciences Center. We now call it OHSU. And she was planning on retiring. So how perfect. <laughs> um, and Joe knew that he could get a job almost anywhere as an intern internal medicine physician. So we came out to Portland um, a couple of times and we decided to move out here to accept positions at OHSU. Um, 
well, in the meantime, um, in January of 1980, we went to Bogota, Colombia, and adopted our son, Ben. And in June 1980, um, which you may know um, was one month from the day the mountain blew here. <laughs> um, today is actually the anniversary of the, um, the explosion of Mount St. Helens. Um, and we came out here anyway, Joe and Ben and I, um, fully expecting to, you know, do our things um, and continue our lives here. Before we had left Massachusetts, I was already delving into art again. And um, I had found somebody in the town we lived in who was a very good watercolorist from whom I took lessons. And I had been painting again for almost a year. I also had taken classes at the Worcester Art Museum and I learned how to paint on canvas. So in 1981, a year after I had come here to be a scientist, I resigned and I left my lab and all of my library um, to colleagues at OHSU and Instead, um, I became sort of a part-time artist, a part-time mom, and I also was a docent at the Portland Art Museum. Um, between 1981 and 1983, I, had, I decided that I was definitely going to art school. I enrolled in uh, PNCA, Pacific Northwest College of Art, in the fall of 1983 and I became a full-time student at that point. In December of 1983, um, we adopted our daughter, Rebecca, um, which forced me to change my schedule a little bit, as you might imagine. Um, I had to move from full-time art student to part-time art student, which was fine. And I took my sweet time getting my BFA, um, which I did receive in 1987. Right away, I joined Blackfish Gallery, um, which is the oldest cooperative gallery in Portland. And I have to say that I really learned a great deal during my um, three and a half years at Blackfish. Um, I helped to organize an exhibit, and we can now go to the next slide. Great, thank you. Um, which, um, the exhibit that I helped organize was an exhibit on apartheid. Remember that? Um, there was still apartheid in South Africa in 1988. Um, and I was very interested in South Africa for a lot of reasons. I was also very interested in racism and um, especially with the lack of um, other ethnic groups in Portland at the time. Um, I had previously lived in very large cities where there was a lot more diversity and um, there were some struggles which I can talk about at the end of the talk where I encountered um, unexpected racism here. Anyway, I started a long series of um, charcoal drawings and this is um, one that I particularly cherish um, that was done in 1990. Um, this, as you can see, is a very realistic drawing, um, as is the next slide. That one, okay. Where, as you can see, I'm really depicting specific people um, of specific ethnicities. Um, and I've, these drawings are very large. They're 42 inches in one direction and larger than that in another. Um, I did several of these drawings. In fact, I probably did over 30 of them in total. They took me an extremely long time. And so between 1988 and 1996 or so, I was working on this series. Next slide. <clears throat> Um, in this example, um, I'm still using some of the depictions of particular ethnicities, but you'll notice some changes happening here. One is that the figure in the foreground um, can be identified. 
The figure in the background, however, is beginning to fade away and um, is no longer really um, someone you can identify. Also, you'll notice that there is a great deal of space <laughs> opening up in these pieces. Um, and I, <clears throat> I was beginning to become um, more conscious of my initial drawing. How do you start? How do you depict people? Um, what is most important? What is the essence of what you're doing? And in the next drawing, next slide, Okay, you'll see that this is becoming a trend. Um, in these, in this particular drawing, um, you really can't identify the people. And in the background, um, I have kind of some sketchy lines also in the on the left, which are indicating that there are figures there, but you know who cares what they look like basically, and you know what's going on. Um, this is as I started to move from somewhat contented forms into moving and struggling and fighting forms, um, the result of racism and apartheid, um, I began to be very interested in the gestural poses that I was looking at. Um, next slide. Okay, this is one of the last in the series. Um, this is a very huge piece and the faces are completely gone. Um, the lines are telling you a lot about the movement of the figure and um, what's going on. Uh, because these pieces were so large, in order to show them in some way, um, I, I showed them at first by rolling them up and carrying them places. And then as I started showing them um, across the state and into Washington and other places, I needed to frame them. And um, so my sincere thanks again to my husband for helping me drag these all over the place um, in large vans where we took them from gallery to gallery um, until I finally, and he finally said enough. And so I put these drawings together um, with my writings, which I did as I was doing these. Um, into book form, and that's shown in the next slide. Um, and this book is called Forms of Protest, Drawings and Poems About Racism. Um, and I actually published this um, with the help of grants from the city and the state and elsewhere. Um, it was published in 1994. I did have some copies in our temple's gift shop, and I don't know if they're still there or not, probably not, but they might be. Um, and I still do have some if you're at all interested. But the book kind of helped me finalize and distribute um, my ideas about racism. It also helped me um, kind of put to rest this whole theme um, of struggle and racism. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, once I kind of stopped focusing on those, I started working on figurative work of other types. I wanted to go back to color, but I was very interested still in the moving form um, and gesture work. Um, I taught several classes in figure and in drawing and in painting. Um, and in one class that I taught actually at Multnomah Art Center, which some of you might know here in Portland, um, I was teaching figure and watercolor. Next slide. And um, quite by chance, I um, didn't have a brush <laughs> and I didn't have a pencil. <laughs> And so, I don't know what I had. I had a bottle of ink, um, and it was a bottle of very intense watercolor ink. Um, so I used the dropper from that bottle and was showing my students how to start a figure. And it wasn't this particular figure, but you can see that you can just take a dropper, or maybe you can't see this, and use your arm or your hand and draw a line with the ink. And the ink 
kind of flows out. Um, it splashes a little bit, but it eventually makes a figure. And um, in the next slide, you'll see another one that's a little brighter. And you can see that central line, which looks like the spine of a figure. And it goes right into a leg. And then I add the arms and the leg, the rest of the legs. The head usually comes at the end. Um, so I'm not sure why that happens. Um, in the next slide. OK, sometimes I added watercolor to this ink um, because it made the form much clearer. And there were galleries that wanted to see something that was a little bit um, less ambiguous than some of these ink drawings. Um, next slide. As I was working more and more with these uh, ink figures, I began to experiment with more than one figure. And it became um, really a challenge to do two figures in one composition and try to make them work with each other, which meant <laughs> um, that I threw away a lot of watercolor paper. Um, but um, I finally got this to work so that you know I've probably done close to 100 of these um, since the mid 90s. And at this point, Chelsea, can you do the video? Is that possible? Thanks. OK. I'm going to show you how I do these. OK. This is me in a corner of my studio. And OK, I'm holding that bottle of ink. It's very small. It's called PH Martin watercolor ink. And um, I'm just going to start. You'll see me making um, a big line, um, a, just a curvilinear line, and then another one. And then I spend some time looking at it. Sometimes I have to spend a lot of time looking at it. But I can find the arms usually first. Sometimes it has to be the legs. I'm not sure. But I'm a little slower on doing the arms and the legs than I am at the initial um, gesture. But as I work, I'm trying to create forms that will work together. Um, and you can see I've got two arms and one leg. And I guess I did the head on this one before I did the other leg. Um, or maybe I didn't. OK, then I'm going over to the second figure and trying to create um, arms there. You, know, you can see the ink spills out of the dropper, and I just have to take it as it goes. Um, and here comes another one. And I never know really what I'm going to get. But you know, it's sort of serendipity. And um, at some point, it'll look like two figures <laughs> interacting or else I'll just throw the piece of paper away. <laughs> you can't turn these over because the ink sort of goes through. OK, and I think, let's see what I do there. I probably picked up some of the excess ink because it does pool a little bit. Um, that's it. And I just leave that to dry. It usually dries overnight. Um, and that's the end of the video. So now you know my secret. Um, and here's another one. Oh, you can go to the next one. Thank you. Okay. And I can use different colors of ink. This one is very splashy. Some inks are a little um, more fluid than others, so you get different effects. Okay. Um, in the next slide, you'll see um, this is kind of a different look. I was using the dropper. Um, when I went to life drawing classes during this time, and I still attend these, these classes, um, where there's a model in front of me who poses for um, gesture drawings, which last about a minute and a half. And in that time, I try to get the pose of the model. Um, and I have to work a little more slowly. These look a little more recognizable most of the time. In the next slide, this is, I call this hurling man. Um, he has a pole. And I, I get in as much as I can in the minute and a half with that ink. Um, 
and you can see that you know I have I have a definite form to look at here. It's not imaginary. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I also wanted to um, show you some of the other work I was doing at the time of the ink work. Um, I was also still working on Canvas, um, or I should say beginning to work on Canvas again. Um, this is a larger piece that was done initially on raw Canvas. It's just you know straight Canvas, like you would take a piece of fabric. I tacked it to the wall, I wet it, and then I stained it with the watercolor ink and with very watered down acrylic paint. Um, and then using Conte crayon, which is like a, a very dense pastel, I drew into the wet um, surface and found figures in that. I often did three figures in this. I'm not sure why, but that just happened. Um, then I would let it dry, and then I would put it on a frame and show these. Next slide, please. Okay. And sometimes um, these figures <laughs> became almost non-figures. Um, this is actually very thick acrylic um, that I, I used, and the, the sort of figure um just happened and most of this was done with um a palette knife so if anybody any of you paint you'll know this is not a brush i used a brush at the beginning for the background and then i went in with palette knife and just created something that's figure like next slide please <clears throat> okay i'm going to show you some of my um semi-abstract landscape paintings um since I also um, did those. And I'm just going to go through these quickly for the sake of time. Next slide. This is acrylic on canvas. Um, and most of these landscape paintings were done um, after trips to various places. Um, both Southern California and Hawaii influenced a lot of my paintings, um, especially the, the palm trees, the foliage, the colors, the textures. Next slide. Um, in 2015, um, Joe and I joined a group and traveled to Southern Utah, where um, I got a chance to look at the amazing structures in Zion and in um, Bryce National Parks and other places there. And I was very taken by the forms, the textures, the colors of the place. And I, I spent the next two years or so working on a series a lar of large canvases, as you can see here. Um, and I showed these in various places. Next slide. And then we took a trip to New Zealand. Um, and um, from these, from that trip, um, I also did a series of paintings. And um, this is one example um, where, again, it's, it's abstract, but not completely abstract. And it gives you a sense of the land, the sea, the sky in the area where I visited. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, and I'm going to show you what I'm doing or what I've been doing since about 2017. Um, when we, we were doing a lot of traveling, thank goodness, who knew about the pandemic, but um, we went to China in 2017. And I was very taken by the art there, um, particularly by the long scrolls and by um, work on wood, um, especially the carvings and the burnings on wood. So let's start right in on the next one. Okay, and I started to burn wood. I, I couldn't do much with it because my burnisher kept getting stuck in the wood grain and it was very frustrating. So I went to cork and was able to make some figures on layers of cork, which I then adhered to wood. These weren't as um, curvilinear as I wanted, so I went to other methods. Next slide, please. 
in which I actually have been painting directly on wood, wood that is either glazed or stained or both. And sometimes um, what I do is I um, work with my framer and he puts them on fabric and then um, frames them so that they're they're kind of neatly put together for hanging. Um, galleries like to have things that they can hang. <laughs> the next slide, thank you, shows you another example of this in which um, I painted the wood a Chinese red and then used um, a silver acrylic to make the figures. And again, the figures are very gestural and they're meant to look like the calligraphic um, symbols that you see in Chinese language and other Asian language. I purposely did that in a vertical format. Um, next slide. Okay, and sometimes I used um, larger horizontal pieces of wood. I'm still doing these. Um, this one is 42 inches long and um, I would use the wood grain and uh, the texture of the wood oftentimes, and sometimes there was even some bark on the wood itself. Um, I sanded the wood and um, glazed it and then painted with black acrylic on the wood, and I've made several of these as well. In the next slide, there is a very small piece, you know, I've kind of done these in all kinds of scales. This one is only six inches by 12 inches. And I've used a stylus um, after I stained the wood and it dried. I made little gold figures on these and it was the proportions were such that I could make three columns here. Okay, so um, I'd like to try to sum everything up a little bit. I think in the next slide, Chelsea. Okay, good. Um, I want to um, give you what I consider similarities between science and art, kind of um, explaining that um, there, the two careers that I've had and have are not that different. Um, that in both science and art, you really do, you need good observation skills, you need to have creativity, and you also need curiosity. That's extremely important. Um, the other important thing is the ability to work alone for long hours. Um, those of you who are in research or artists know that you're by yourself for a long time um, trying to figure out what you're doing. So you need persistence, you need patience, you need tenacity um, to go on with what you're doing. And there are plenty of days when you say, you know, I'm going nowhere, why am I doing this? Um, the, the important thing is experimentation, as you saw in this last, um, effort that I have been making with the, the attempt to combine Chinese art with my own love of moving figure. Um, you just have to try different things and you have to repeat different things and be content um, to keep working at it. In both fields, you need to see some kind of a goal or a theme in what you're doing. Um, and if if you stay focused on that, I think it keeps you going. Um, and you have to articulate what you've done. You have to be able to articulate what you've done. In the next slide, thank you, I've put together what I consider differences between um, my career in science and art. First of all, education. Um, I think it's it's pretty obvious that if you want an academic career in research science, um, you need to go through quite a lot of education to find um, a a good career um, in science. In art, you know, you can go ahead and get as many degrees as you want in art, um, but you don't have to. Um, if you have the the flair for art, you know, you can go to classes and learn it and become a successful artist. 
Um, I put a question mark on the sec on the second one. You know, what is an achievement of success in science versus art? Um, I think you know they're very different, especially in our country, um, where and this is the third point: the respect that scientists have in Western society and maybe in all societies is very different than the respect given to artists. And um, that's something that I think maybe helped me go into science first. Um, the schedule that a scientist has to follow versus that of an artist is extremely different. I was working pretty much 24 seven in science. Um, and in art, I started that way, but I realized I didn't need to do that. Um, another difference is the earning power. Obviously, artists don't make a lot of money in general. Um, and it also varies from year to year. You can be very successful one year in selling your art, um, and the following year you sell nothing. So most artists have another career. I taught a great deal so that I had a continuum of income. Um, and in science, if you find a position, you're pretty much guaranteed a salary. Writing and speaking are extremely important in science. They're not as much so in art, but obviously if you're, if you're a teacher, you have to do that. In both fields, you have to demonstrate what you're doing. And then finally, um, I created this pillar of wisdom um, <laughs> and it says, don't kill anything for art. Um, and I think that will resonate with some people more than others. Okay, um, I'm just gonna show one last slide. And this is a piece that I showed recently in the building where I live, um, because it is from my series um, of protests, but I never put it in my book because I did it toward the end. And I showed it recently because it resonates so much with what we're going through now in today's struggles. So with that, I will thank everybody. Um, and um, again, thank the committee and thank Chelsea. And even though I may not have mentioned it, um, I wanna thank my husband, Joe Kane. Um, who's been with me along this crazy career path um, and who supported me when I told him, guess what, <laughs> I'm leaving science. <laughs> You'll have to support us. <laughs> um, and he did. Um, and that therein is my talk. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't know if there's time for questions um, or how you want to work this. We do have some questions. Uh, Anita mentioned we'll have to unmute yourself, please. We have a few questions and the audience can add some questions in the chat. And I already see one question. I see a question. So I think I'll call on the person who has the question, which is I see Rosie has a question. <laughs> Great. I was curious. I, I am I am a scientist and not an artist. And um, your last phrase about the differences is don't kill anything for art. And I didn't have any kind of nuance about what that means. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a private joke, but I had to put it in here. Um, okay. And I will I will tell you, even though um, my daughter um, truly <laughs> will never forgive me. When you're doing research science, you need to kill animals. Um, and I apologize in advance to all the cat lovers out there, but I needed to sacrifice cats oh, no. um, in order to study their brains. And when my daughter found that out, she was ready to leave home, but she didn't. Um, and it was one of the reasons actually that I had to leave science. I couldn't do that anymore. Um, but the other thing is, um, and I know there's somebody on this Zoom call who will appreciate it. 
Um, we were in Massachusetts at the De Cordova Museum, and there was a wonderful exhibit. Um, uh, it was a group exhibit, but in the exhibit, the artist had chosen um, to, uh, what I, I thought, sacrifice small animals to create his pieces. And I thought, okay, you can find dead animals and you can put them into your art, but don't kill anything for art. That that definitely struck me as a, as a thing to prohibit. Um, you know, you can draw animals, you can create sculptures of animals, but don't kill them. Um, and that has stayed with me. So that's my, that's my pillar of wisdom as an artist. <laughs> See if you can see people. <laughs> so I, I'm going to bounce to some group questions if I could. Just we okay. started out with one that I'm personally curious about because I always loved art, but I didn't really do it until my master's in art and uh, master's of art and teaching program when I took an art class. But I always mm -hmm. liked art, but I never had the opportunities. So for you, Eileen, did, were you interested in art as a child? Um, I've always been interested in art. Um, and um, in, my, in the book I wrote, there's, um, there's a sort of an introduction poem in which I say, um, I've always been an artist, at least since 1945, oh. the year I was born. Um, yes, I, I drew early on. Um, my dad was an architect um, and an artist, and um, he taught me to do watercolors early in my life. Um, so that actually is my most comfortable medium. Um, I love working with watercolors, and I go back to them all the time. I take them with me when I travel. And then I, I took classes all through my schooling. Um, and, you know, my divergence in college was mostly based on the fact that although I went to a women's college, there were all men in the art department there. And um, they did not have real respect for women becoming professional artists. Um, whereas in the science department, there were a lot of very, um, very respected and strong women, and they encouraged me. And I think that was the dichotomy that sent me toward science, basically. Oh, and I, I still, yeah. And also, I should mention that I, I did life drawing um, even when, as a faculty member. Nice. Well, um I see that there's another question in the chat, but I can't see the chat in print. Can anyone see it? Can you, Chelsea? I see. I, oh, I only see one question, and it's the one that we already asked from Rosie. Oh, it is. Okay. Okay. Well, we had, I'll do one more that I was interested I thought was interesting when the group made up questions. And that was, um, what guidance would you give somebody who desires a career in art? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, there are a lot of, a lot of questions to ponder. You know, I, I have a 10 year old granddaughter who wants to be an artist. <laughs> um, I think, um, what I would consider is, um, do you know enough about art to make that choice? And in my case, you know, I, I've learned over the years that I really didn't know enough about art and artists. And I think if I had early on, I probably would have chosen to go into art earlier. Um, that art can be very deep and meaningful, um, that it can be highly intellectual, um, that there are a lot of realms of art. Um, you know, I, I never really thought about collaborative art. I never considered theater art. I never thought of any of the amazing fields that are available to artists now. 
um, before, you know, I just thought, oh, you know, you're an artist, you go into your studio and you paint and you draw and you have shows and that's fun. Um, but it just didn't occur to me that there are a lot of possibilities. And I think if you look around you and see what's available, you can make a better choice. I also think that the, the points that I made about being alone a lot, um, of um, not being able to define success very well, except to yourself and to being frustrated constantly and wondering why you're doing this <laughs> um, are, are really elements to consider that you have to have a certain kind of personality to stay with it. Um, and I think it's important to go to art school. I really do. Um, I learned a great deal there. Um, even though I was twice the age of the other students who were there at the time. Um, I really, I, it was intense um, and I had to challenge myself all the time. And I saw that, you know, I had talent and so did a lot of other people. Um, so that, you know, you, you know, you're gonna be up against a lot of other people who are trying to do this. And, you know, I, I tend to be a little competitive. And so <laughs> you have to know that, that this is, if you want to do this and be successful, you have to accept the fact that you're going to have to work at it. Um, and then, of course, the earning power. Are you going to have to be your own source of income? Is that going to be how you're going to be living? And if so, um, do you think you can make it as an artist? You know, some people, there are artists I know who live extremely frugally. Um, I know one married couple who they live in Chicago. Um, they're from here originally and they went there and they decided that they were just going to go for it. They weren't gonna have family, they were gonna teach, they teach at the Art Institute and they don't own a car and they don't travel, <laughs> you know, but they're both very well-respected artists. So there are a lot of choices you have to make to be successful. Okay, thank you. I have another question that came in the chat. And, oh, okay. Uh, yes, can you tell us about your choice of the really huge canvases? Oh, you mean for the drawings or the yeah, paintings? Yeah, for the drawings or, and paintings. For the drawings. Especially yeah. the drawings are really huge. They are huge and they're, they're bigger than life size. Um, and I'm a short person <laughs> and yeah. Um, I think if I think back to it, there was so much emotion in those drawings. And I started small. Um, I started with a drawing that was mm, maybe 16 by 20. And it was, um, I remember that drawing um, when I started this series and it really, it made me cry. And I needed to, I needed to expand sort of my emotional life into more physical form. And so I decided to work bigger. And by using my arms and my body, um, I think that that helped me express what I wanted to say um, in a, a truer form, um, a stronger form. Um, I certainly was exhausted, <laughs> um, but it really, it did help. It was, it was a means of expression for me. Came from your whole arm, it was like your whole Yeah, arm. yeah, it really was, yeah. And sometimes it, you know, with the paintings, when I work big, like with the Zion paintings, um, I just, how can you express Zion in a small painting? <laughs> Thank, thanks, Eileen. With the few minutes we have left, I don't have any more questions in the chat. And I wonder if anyone here would like to raise their hand and ask a question. Okay. Um, let's see, this is, can't see the name. The person just, oh, Carla? No? Pat. Yeah. Pat. I see Pat, yeah. Yeah, Pat. I, I live in a building with Eileen and saw her enormous protest picture. And she may have been emotional painting it, but it's very emotional to see. 
to look at it. Yeah, and that's, I think that's the other thing. Thank you, Pat, is that that scale does engender an emotional response. Yeah, that it's, um, you can't not look at it. Right. <laughs> Um, it's just so strong. Thank you. Yeah, that's what it was meant to be. Yeah. So another question, Sally? Yeah. Um, Rabbi Joseph had to put a, um, to put a question. I had the same question. And um, that is, have the events of the past year um, influenced where your art has been in the past year and where it will go in the future? Oh boy, <laughs> I've been asked that already and um, it's hard to predict. Um, things have obviously changed um, in this past year. I have fortunately been able to go to my studio, which is, a, a, it's two miles from my home. So I can actually walk there or in bad weather, we have a streetcar that goes there. So I have, I have gone to my studio um, in spite of the lockdowns. I've been able to work um, not for long periods of time, um, but I can. And um, yes, I found that my, my attention span <laughs> was pretty short. Um, and that I was carrying a lot of the baggage that we all carried this year in terms of um, the horror of the pandemic, the horror of the racism that's become so apparent um, and that I had worked on and knew about for so many years and it was part of me. Um, you know, I think, um, that was probably one of the reasons I wanted to show that one big drawing. Um, and um, I, I painted again, I went back and I painted fairly large um, and did a, a few paintings over the past year, not many. Um, I wasn't satisfied with them. They weren't doing anything for me. Um, and I spent a great deal of time outdoors um, those of you who live around here know <laughs> that I do a lot of walking. Um, and we live on a river and Joe and I have a little place on the coast that we go to. And I, I became enamored of birds um, and notably of herons um, this year. And you can see, if, if you can see where Joe's sitting, <laughs> There's a heron <laughs> behind him, um, which is beautiful. Uh, that's that's part of our place. Um, I've done oh I don't know twelve or fifteen or twenty herons in the past year, and I'm not sure why. Um, maybe because they're another life form that is beautiful and they can fly off and they don't get COVID, as far as I know. <laughs> um, and they're just enjoying their lives and they're, you know, they're fun to paint and the habitat's fun. And so um, one wall of my studio now has heron paintings. <laughs> and that's, that's kept me calm and focused this year. I'm still also doing my Chinese Asian work um, and I will continue to do that. Um, and I will say with regard to, I did a painting um, which was mentioned in the, um, the temple bulletin that I did at a service um, not long ago. And um, that has sort of inspired me too, um, to go on and start doing some more spontaneous paintings that may or may not have figure in them, I'm not sure. Um, you know, it's um, my my spiritual self um, is very much with me in the studio. And, um, you know, who knows? I, I think if there are a lot of answers to that. Um, and I, I think, uh, yes, in, yes is the answer. <laughs> 
I've made some changes. Yeah, I see, I see a connection. I know we have to stop soon, but it just all of a sudden flashed in my mind that as I was watching your drawings of the brain connections and the nerve, <laughs> I was Good. seeing the same kind of swirls like Thank in your you. other paintings and especially like in the heron. And can you tell if that is a connection <laughs> intentionally or? It was not intentional and um, good for you because it took me a while to see that wow. that the following the Golgi um, things looks very much like many of my ink drawings and I had I had a show um, oh my goodness I think it was 1996 or 7 when I first showed the ink drawings in a small studio a small gallery and I was standing there looking at the drawings and I was talking to somebody and that struck me. It yeah. was, oh my gosh, I'm looking <laughs> at Golgi drawings. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there's, there, there is a similarity there. And maybe I saw figures when I was seeing nerve cells. I have no idea, but there oh, is a connection. Definitely, there. Yeah. I see the shape. Yeah. And that. Good, good for you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've had a little bit of art training, and I do. Well, it. good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I will just add quickly that I'm taking a class on Chinese art right now, and um, they mention a lot of times about um, the linear nature of the art. Um, and if you are familiar at all with Asian art, you'll see that there is a lot of that um, very curvilinear work um, and continuous work um, in scrolls and in Asian work. Interesting. Thank you. Well, yeah. Rabbi Joseph, do you want to say anything in conclusion? <laughs> You're kind of the, the chair of our, as chair of our group. <laughs> no, what I love is that it actually comes from all of you. So, yeah. <laughs> and I, I love, I mean, thank you so much, Eileen. I also, we've had lots of conversations over the years and I learned so much from you today you know, that we, we hadn't even discussed before. And that's what's so beautiful is that we are such multifaceted human beings. And what I love about this series of coming together and sharing pieces of ourselves um, that we don't often share and having the opportunity, you know, you had the opportunity to put this together, um, which I'm sure was a uh, quite an introspective process and, and at this time and just really appreciate those connections and that we're always growing and changing. Um, I find that really incredibly inspiring, especially at a time like this. And as we're sort of, you know, emerging and trying to figure out what that, what that world is going to be and going to look like, and that we're all going to create that together. And I'm so glad that you're a part of our community to, to figure that out. And it really is, is such a gift. Um, and I just thank you so much for giving your time and your talent, um, as we say, and just so, so much. <laughs> I want to keep the conversation, <laughs> keep the conversation going and we'll have to have, you know, in a year from now and see what you've created or what you will create over this year to come you know, it's going to be really inspiring. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone for being here. Thank, thank you, you so to much. Yeah. Rosie and thank Sally you. and Anita and Rita who come together and help make this happen. Chelsea Ferguson, our behind the scenes, amazing staff person. She's great. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. <laughs> we couldn't do anything without Chelsea. So we are incredibly, <laughs> incredibly grateful and lucky. We might, we might also mention that we are open to additional speakers. If any of you have a special exper expertise or experience or something you'd like to share with other members of the congregation, we are open to putting more things on our calendar. Or if you know somebody in the congregation that you oh. think should give one of these Teaching Tuesdays, we'd be, we'd be very happy to hear about that. Yeah. And our next one... Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and our next one is um, Henry's going to talk, right? Henry's uh, Henry Kanowski is going to be a tour of Beth Israel and uh, what, you know, the design of that. And then after that, he's going to do one on the stained glass windows. Mm -hmm. oh. One other comment is that um, these sessions are recorded. So, um, I know there's a lot of people who are interested and sometimes can't make it at this time, but it 
it's recorded and will be available for viewing under past events or past programs. Good. So send everyone to listen to Eileen again. We can listen to it again and we'll probably pick up new things and <laughs> new tidbits. Okay. Yes. Next time in your studio. <laughs> that would be great. Next, yeah. yeah. Next year. Yeah. Yeah. Next, Next year. year in your studio. Exactly. In right. In yeah. person without masks. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Good to Thank see you. everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Oh, bye. 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 Bye, Carla, Donna. Bye. Bye. Eileen, that oh, was oh, wonderful. Joe left. Oh, she, oh left. she left. I know. I was like, Joe. God, I know. But that's. <laughs> oh.